We left last week with Mao bringing back Dong Xiaoping from exile to mop up the mess that China was in after nearly a decade of its cultural revolution. And Dong certainly wasted no time in getting to work as he set about what were called the Four Modernizations. According to Dong, China needed to modernize its agriculture, its industry, its military, and then also its science and technology too. And Dung was back with more power than ever before. He was vice chairman of the party and head of foreign affairs, and with Mao old and close to death, this meant that Dung was running the show. With Zhou Enlai also unable to work due to his bladder cancer, Dung also stepped into the role of premier of the state council. No one except Mao had ever enjoyed this much power in the PRC. However, in January of 1976, Zhou Enlai's battle with cancer was over, and he died. And though Mao viewed Zhou as competent, he didn't want him to be lionized in the eyes of the public for a number of reasons that you can see in earlier episodes. He didn't attend his old deputy's funeral, though his health was pretty poor at the time, and his wife and leader of the Gang of Four, Jiang Qing, refused to tip her hat to Zhou at the funeral. It was of course Deng Xiaoping who gave Zhou's eulogy. The public was furious at this and set up thousands of memorials to Zhou in Tiananmen Square. Some even taking shots at Mao, saying that when Zhou died, the first emperor of China died. Old and close to death himself, Mao was scared. Jiang Qing's Gang of Four acted quickly and blamed Zhou's old friend, Dong Xiaoping, for all the chaos that was taking place. And close to death, Mao acted desperately. The Politburo stripped Dong of all of his posts, though he was still allowed to be a party member. They also formalized the appointment of Hua Guofeng as Mao's successor. And it proved to be just in time because at 10 minutes past midnight on the 9th of September 1976, Mao died from heart failure. The chairman was dead. Hello there. That was by far my longest prelude I've ever done, but in 1976, things in China just moved at such a high pace that we really could do a podcast length episode on each month of the year. Now, it's really important to remember that the death of Mao would be an extremely strange thing to live through simply because he'd been the chairman for nearly 30 years. I assume not many of us watching here are Russian, but it will be strange to see a Russian leader that isn't Putin in the not too distant future. And so then fortunately for Hua, but then unfortunately for Deng, Hua's succession was confirmed by the chairman just before Mao's death. And so as Hua took over, there were two main people wanting his position. Obviously, we have Deng Xiaoping, who was running the show just before Mao died. But then there was also Jiang Qing, who believed that she should be the one to take over from her late husband. But both Deng and Jiang had very different ideas as to how to approach the situation that they'd been passed over for Hua. Jiang Qing contested the leadership straight away and went to many of the CCP trying to get them to sign a letter that endorsed her leadership of the party. Now, this failed, and Hua Guofeng had her and the Gang of Four arrested. And ever the victim when she needed to be, Jiang Qing wept and shouted, the chairman's body is barely dead, and you have the goal to mount a coup. Jiang Qing and a gang were imprisoned and were to await trial in 1980. However, Dong's approach was very different to Jiang's. Dong had already spent time in exile, and he knew that it was a place that he could really come back from. He wrote to Hua saying that he actually approved of Hua's position as the new leader with all of his heart. Now, Hua was not convinced by this, and he lumped Deng with the Gang of Four. However, Deng had actually enjoyed much more support within the party than Jiang's Gang of Four ever enjoyed, and Hua knew that he couldn't afford to arrest Deng and keep the party leadership happy. Movements grew within the party demanding that Mao's Tiananmen verdict, where he stripped Deng of all of his posts, should be overturned, and that Deng should be given back his old responsibilities like foreign affairs. Now, Hua vehemently opposed this, and probably understandably so. But the media also started to support Deng, and the People's Daily ran an article that supported Deng's idea that Mao Zedong thought really could be changed to fit with appropriate times. At the 11th CCP Congress in 1977, Hua had no choice but to formally end the Cultural Revolution, and at the same time, to reinstate Deng Xiaoping to be the third highest member in the Politburo. If he hadn't have done that, the party leadership would have turned against him. But it showed that Hua clearly had nowhere near the grip on power that Mao had ever had. And in an effort to enforce the fact that he was the chairman, Hua got his haircut to look like Mao, and then he launched a 10-year plan to modernize Chinese industry. And though Chinese industry needed modernization, what he was about to do was similar to the Great Leap Forward where too much happened too quickly. Heavy government spending led to a 15.5% budget deficit, and much of that money went towards wage increases for factory workers rather than machinery. And so when everyone's wage increased without much more productivity, inflation at worrying levels began to kick in. Come 1980, Jiang and her gang stood to face trial. Jiang was defiant. She smirked and yawned as her indictment was read out, and her defense was that she was just carrying out Mao's orders. Jiang was found guilty on charges relating to the persecution of creative artists and for destroying evidence too. She received the death penalty with a two-year suspension to allow time for reform, 
but by 1983 her sentence was changed to life in prison, but then she died in 1991 at the age of 77 after hanging herself. The rest of Jiang's gang received anywhere from 19 years to life in prison. But as the sentences were being read out, Hua's hold on power was extremely weak. Inflation had risen to 6%, and in 1978, Deng forced Hua to bring back those who were purged in the Cultural Revolution. The net effect of this was that people who were loyal to Deng rather than to Mao, and as a result Hua, were entering the political system again, shoring up Deng's numbers rather than Hua's. In December 1980, Hua was mercilessly attacked in Politburo sessions, and he was accused of not being up for the job of leading. Hua was actually asked to resign from the party, and his resignation was accepted, though it still took him a little bit of time for him to leave completely. Technically, Hua's position wasn't replaced by Deng, and in fact, Deng still only ranked third in the Politburo, behind Hu Yaobang, who was the chairman of the party, and Marshal Yi. However, Deng was just an OG. He was there for the Long March, the Civil War, the Hundred Flowers Campaign, the Great Leap Forward, and then most recently, the Cultural Revolution. He was the CCP's longest standing major player, and so though he was technically third in charge, as number one, Hu Yaobang said, Deng was the supreme decision maker in the CCP. The little man had once again come back from total exile. Thanks for watching. Make sure to tune in next week as we see China's economic surge in the 1980s, and make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss any of the action. We can't wait to see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.